All right, guys, let's talk history. So we're going to cover the Cherokee removal. And the reason I'm covering the Cherokee removal is because not only is a lot of the history roots really deeply around here to the Cherokee removal, but we're also going to be talking about stand weight. And so the Cherokee removal is super integral to what happens with Stan Wavy and his history in this area after the Cherokees are moved. So you all have heard the stories about the Trail of Tears and the removal of the Cherokee people. So let's talk about kind of what kick-started the Cherokees being removed from Georgia. So, you know, relationships between the white settlers and Georgia and the Cherokee people had been getting bad for a while. Um, you know, the Cherokees held land and they farmed. So the Cherokee nation was viewed and recognized as its own government with its own rules. And those were the rules that the Cherokee people listened to. They did not listen to the Georgia government rules. They viewed their nation as their government, which is how it should have been. But the Georgia government got frustrated with them because they couldn't make the Cherokee do what they wanted them to do. And what they wanted them to do was basically give up all their land to the white settlers. Um, you know, cotton became a very huge crop in the South. At first, cotton wasn't super profitable because of how hard it was to pick and to process. So when the cotton gin was invented, they saw an explosion of cotton farming down South. Well, the lands that the Cherokee people held were super fertile and rich and grew very good crops. So the white settlers started encroaching upon that land. They wanted that land for their own use and basically tried to shove the Cherokee people off and not let them have their rights and be viewed as part of the nation. The Cherokee people... Um, lived on the land and farmed the land and they used just enough for their families to feed their families. But the land itself belonged to the nation, to the government. Um, so that was one of the reasons that the Georgia government looked at the land that the Cherokee people held and recognized and, and in their mind thought it was kind of no man's land because they did not view the Cherokee people as a government, as its own country, which is what they were trying to be, their own country within a country, basically, is the best way I can describe it. So the, the government in Georgia refused to look at the Cherokee Nation as its own country and thought that they had the right to boss them around, basically. And guys, you got to remember back then, the states had a lot of rights. The states were almost, in a sense, their own little countries. That's the best way I can describe how the states were. They didn't listen to the main federal government like they do today. There was lots of reasons for this. I could get into a whole cultural theory on why the states were the way they were. A lot of it roots back into the, the immigration of the different races of the Europeans who came in and settled those places. Um, but that's a whole story for a whole another day. So the states held on to their rights. They wanted their rights. And the federal government was already kind of having some issues with the states, even back when the Cherokees were being removed. Because you got to remember, the Civil War was just around the corner. So there was just a lot of bad stuff going on in the South right about then. And so these white settlers were looking at the land held by the nation and thinking, mm, I'd like a piece of that. I'd like to farm that ground and that ground. And they're not using it for anything profitable. And so a lot of the Cherokee, they started kind of adopting the customs and the ways of their white neighbors. And they also began to grow cotton and requested all the equipment that they needed to grow cotton. And they did a good job of it. And so that made tensions even worse between some of the settlers and the Cherokees because that was taking profits away that could have been theirs and giving comp, you know, competition to them that should not have been there in their mind. That should not be land that they didn't have access to because it was just owned by the Cherokees is how they viewed it. And it wasn't right, but again, 
history is full of cases like that where it's not right, but it's history, and history repeats itself. Go crack a world history book and look at lots of other countries all around the world and the frictions that they had. You'll see it echoed in what the Cherokees and the white settlers were doing to each other. So it was not good. Right about then, things got worse because they found gold in Georgia. It was the first gold rush in the United States. And we know how crazy people got during gold rushes when they thought they could get some free gold. So the nation was was resisting white people coming in and digging on their land. So that was another reason things weren't going too well right about then. Because, by golly, they wanted to come in there and dig for gold, and it just wasn't going to happen. So I'm looking down here at my notes, making sure I get my dates right. So these hopeful gold speculators, they started trespassing on Cherokee lands. And pressure began to mount against the Georgia government to say, hey, you need to get this land from these Cherokee people and let us use it because we're going we're gonna to use it, by golly, and you need to get it from them. And so Georgia made a move to extend their state laws over the tribal lands and basically say that the Cherokees had no right to their own government. They had to be subject to the Georgia government. And the case actually went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which, remember, back then it's different than it is today. They didn't have quite as much power because the states held on to more rights. So the court refused to recognize the Cherokee Nation as its own sovereign nation. So it got kind of thrown out the window. But then they turned around and they had the case of Worcester, I hope I'm saying that right, versus the state of Georgia in 1832, a year later. And the court ruled then that Georgia could not basically boss the Cherokee around. So in that ruling, the federal government said, look, Georgia, you're getting too big for your britches. Quit trying to tell the Cherokee people what to do. That's not your right. It's our right. As the federal government. So again, the federal government still wasn't sticking up for the Cherokees. It was just telling Georgia to pump its brakes and back off because they had no jurisdiction there. Only the federal government did. So again, you're starting to see some tension and some friction and a lot of these things are building to cause a civil war, which we're going to talk about the Cherokees in the civil war in a little bit. So um, President Andrew Jackson who was president while this was going on. It had started um, a little bit before he was elected as president, but he was basically president and saw this whole deal through. He had no desire to use the power of the national government to protect the Cherokees. There were a lot of reasons for that. One of the foremost reasons I personally feel like, and I think if you did a lot of research on your own, you may would come to the same conclusion. There's tons of theories out there. It was because I feel like he could see the Civil War mounting and the tensions between the states were getting, and, and the government, the southern states and the federal government were already starting to build. And he was doing what he could to keep the peace and basically keep Georgia happy and not try to trample too much on the state's rights. Because if he did, he knew he would have another he would have a civil war on his hands. So there was that. And, you know, maybe there were a few other reasons. I'm not going to get into them here, but if you ever do some research or read books on Andrew Jackson, you could form some of your own theories on it. But, you know, he was already starting to get in the hot seat with some of the the bickering between the government and the states. So um, he had already become entangled in some states' rights issues during his presidency, and that was known as the nullification crisis. So you can look that up, too. Um, so with the Indian Removal Act of 1830, the U.S. Congress gave President Jackson the authority to start negotiating some removal treaties. So if you remember, a treaty is just an agreement between two nations or two people, and it, it kind of brokers a deal. They make a deal with each other, like, look, you give me this, I'll give you that. And so that's what President Jackson was authorized to do with the Cherokee. Say, hey, I give you this, you leave your lands. So he actually started asking them if they would leave 
on their own um, and get out. And 